Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, edition of uh, Rancon. So today the speaker is uh, someone who recently moved to Paris and we're hoping to have a, well, hybrid seminar, something where some people could uh, really attend the seminar, but uh, unfortunately this couldn't happen. So we're going to have a well, regular Zoom meeting. So uh, yeah, we have Eric Permuter today as a speaker. And he will be telling us about uh, some work that he did recently with Castelli Bafa and Valenzuela. So, well, uh, the title is CFT Distance Conjecture. So, Eric, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation, the introduction. And um, as you alluded to, this is not exactly how I wanted to introduce myself to the Paris Strings community, so to speak. But um, what can you do? So. Uh, here we are. I appreciate you attending the seminar, and um, I know I'll be having my own speaker dinner tonight. I encourage you to have your own speaker dinners at your own homes, um, and maybe one day we can all do that together. But for now, uh, we just have each other on Zoom in two dimensions, and so I'll be talking about um, this paper that came out in November, or uh, I, guess, I suppose December, with uh, uh, bootstrapper Leonardo Rastelli and uh, Swamplanders, Carmen Baffa and Irene Valenzuela. Uh, I should note a few other pieces of work. There, there was a nice paper that came out just before ours by Baum and Infante, which has a slightly narrower scope, but a very morally similar point, um, and it's very nicely written. And inspiration for our work came from a few places, uh, including some pretty old papers, um, some work by Douglas, Acharya and Douglas. Uh, first paper is called Land, uh, uh, The Space of Quantum Field Theories. Um, second paper is called The Finite Landscape, and some work by Kamsevich and Soibelman, particularly in low dimensions, um, on constraining, say, two-dimensional CFTs uh, with uh, conformal manifolds. And that'll be the topic of today, uh, but in greater than two dimensions. So, CFTs with exactly marginal couplings admit conformal manifolds, M, and I want to ask what we can say about them abstractly. And so this approach will incorporate elements of the conformal bootstrap, um, some inspiration from thinking about it holographically, and also ideas from the swamp land program, which has mostly been thought about in the context of flat space quantum gravity, but I think has some lessons for, for us bootstrappers, which have not been fully uh, extracted or appreciated. And the upshot will be that we conjecture some relations between the geometry on the conformal manifold M and the spectral data of the CFT besides the data pertaining to the exactly marginal operators which generate uh, the conformal manifold. So our conjectures are specifically about infinite distance limits of points on M, which is a simpler place to start and also a phenomenologically interesting uh, place and the conjectures are simple to state, so let me just state them here. Okay, so the main conjectures are the following. First, that the CFTs that live at infinite distance always contain infinite towers of higher spin currents, which are exactly conserved. And the second claim is that the anomalous dimensions of these higher spin operators as you approach infinite distance vanish exponentially in the distance, which uh, here I'm calling D. Um, and you can rephrase this as a statement about the diameter of the conformal manifold, uh, which we'll define more precisely soon. Uh, and the claim is that the diameter diverges logarithmically in the higher spin gap as the higher spin gap closes to zero uh, for any non-compact conformal manifold. Uh, sorry, Eric. Yeah, uh, sure. Are you saying that uh, at infinite distance, the theories are free? I am saying that at infinite distance, the theories always have a free subsector at least, yes. So morally, yes, but there might be a decoupled interaction. By subsector means something that's completely decoupled, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, the CFT becomes a direct sum of two theories, one of which is free. Uh, the second may be trivial, so. Yes. Um, good, and, and just to emphasize again, in case um, it wasn't completely clear, I'll be working in greater than two dimensions uh, with some comments about two dimensions and why that why why it differs and how you can um, unify what we're saying with what people think about uh, conformal manifolds in 2D. 
Okay. So the outline for the rest of the talk is that first I'll just introduce concepts about conformal manifolds, um, why conformal manifolds are hard to attack from the bootstrap, and then in a separate axis, some ideas from the swamp plan program, which will inform our conjectures. Then I'll state the conjectures. Uh, we'll talk about some evidence for them from the world of SCFTs and theories with, with, with gauge fields, which really do furnish um, essentially all known examples of non-compact and formal manifolds. And finally, the interpretation of these results holographically, which itself will be fairly straightforward if, if you know some ADS-CFT, um, but it'll also lead us to put a bound on this exponent um, alpha, uh, which we observe in, in large families of CFTs. And that is something that is an aspiration of the analogous statements of the swamp plane program. And so we seem to have a, a sharp uh, claim to make in our context. Sorry, Eric, uh, a good question. I mean, uh, don't we have examples where there are some limits where the, the CFT becomes instead a generalized free field? Yeah, so it will be important that the theories in question are, are local. Um, yes, but you can start with a the local theory, but then you can decouple gravity. Right, so I, I'm going to insist that the, the CT, the central charge, is finite, and everything I say pertains to that case. So I, I don't, um, what, what I'm saying does not apply to those cases, but, but you're right. But, the, but you, if, if you have just, I don't know, some scalar in EDS coupled, coupled to gravity, and then you send the, you send the G Newton, uh, you, know, you get rid of the coupling to gravity so that it just becomes a generalized free field. So how, how does that fit into the story? I mean, at every step, the theory is local, but. Yeah, so, so that corresponds, for example, to tuning the central charge larger and larger. Here I have in yeah. mind a story where you have a CFT with fixed central charge, not viewing C as a modulus and varying an exactly marginal coupling. Okay. Sorry, if you vary an exactly marginal coupling, can the central charge change? Uh, in SCFTs in 4D, no. Um, and since, well, uh, one may believe that those are the only uh, 4D theories with conformal manifolds, and so that is, takes care of 4D. Um, in 3D, you know, what we mean by central charge is different anyway. Um, and so maybe there's some room, some wiggle room there, but, but, no, because of the fact that the central charges can't change along M, in, in, at least in four dimensions, that's why this is a sensible perspective. Right. But that's a consequence of supersymmetry, right? A, a yes. non-supersymmetric. Yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But this, the statements of yours, it's for, for superconformal theories, or are you, you're saying something more general? I'm saying something more general, um, but, uh, you know, even in a non-supersymmetric theory, I could choose to um, work in a family of theories with, with some central charge fixed. You know, um, it's a little bit, the same, the claims I'm making don't rely on supersymmetry, but control manifolds may only be realized in, in such cases. And then one could eventually argue that supersymmetry is responsible for what I'm going to say, kind of like the statements about whether non-supersymmetric ADS vacua exist or not. A lot of the physics doesn't seem to be a consequence of supersymmetry, even though you know, some may believe that supersymmetry is required for those vacua to exist. Sure, but then uh, is there a, an assumption that in general you need uh, these manifolds to, that the conformal manifold to, to be of a constant central charge? Uh, there is no, there is no assumption here of that type, no. But um, I'm, there, is, there is an assumption which is even milder, which is that the central charge be finite. Well, could be finite, but then when you move to infinite distance, it could become arbitrarily large. So, uh, yeah, I, I sort of view this as a pathological case in a couple directions of, of what I'll be talking about. Um, I, I see the construction you have in mind, but for now, let's just say uh, that kind of construction is not within the realm of what I'll be discussing. Let's let's keep going, maybe because uh, otherwise, well, it's just a discussion between the two of you. So maybe we can keep going and uh, we we'll leave room for questions afterwards. Maybe so, although I did appreciate those questions and I, I think it's instructive to think about these things, so. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Miguel and Bolt. <laughs> um, good. Okay. So uh, we're gonna consider CFTs in greater than two dimensions with exactly marginal operators O. Uh, so this means that O has exactly conformal dimension delta equals D. And one imagines deforming the 
CFT action by you know, adding these with some coupling constants uh, T. Uh, and these can depend on space time, but OK, that's not important for, for today's discussion. And these form local coordinates on the conformal manifold M. So you can imagine an instant path from T1 to T2. Now the geometry on M is has some Riemannian structure, as, as discussed in some paper by Kitasov from uh, the 90s, maybe even the 80s. Um, for example, the Riemann tensor can be written as a twice integrated four point function of exactly marginal operators along, along M. Uh, the important player in today's discussion will be the Zamilogikov metric, which furnishes a natural metric on M, which is uh, just the matrix of two point functions. Sorry, right, that's uh, not very good. The matrix of two point functions of exactly marginal operators, OI. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the function of the couplings. And so measuring distances on M is done just by, you know, computing the, the integrating the line element from, from one point to another. So I think here you see your conformal manifolds are generated by local operators. Mm -hmm. And so when, for example, if you go back to what Miguel's example was, which was dialing something in, in ADS, that yep. leads you one parameter family of solutions to the crossing equations, but but it's not generated by a local operator there. And I yeah, think it might be important to make that distinction. I, I did try to make it by saying that case was not um, uh, covered under the umbrella of this discussion. Yeah, that, that's uh, why. Okay, I I know, a useful okay. distinction. Yeah, yes, I now see why. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Good. So. Um, Let's define the diameter of M, which is a useful notion. And this is just defined as the supremum of the distances between any points on M. Okay. Now, uh, let's see, good. So if the diameter is finite, then we'd say that uh, M is compact. Uh, on the other hand, if the diameter is infinite, then M is not compact. And so in those situations, you might imagine a path um, out to some infinite distance point. Okay. So you might want to draw this more with, with a cusp like this. Let's go out here. And so let's bring that down. So a question that is quite natural here is when and how can the diameter diverge? And by when and how, I mean um, diagnosing when this happens from the CFT data, besides the metric itself, okay? And by how, I mean understanding the singular behavior of the Zemological metric near these infinite distance points. Okay, so now that we're trying to think about things in terms of the abstract CFT data, um, of course, the conformal bootstrap perspective, which motivates this, is uh, should be brought to the fore. Okay, so can we just, just yes, uh, yes, please. Just my question. So even in the non-compact case, you're expecting to have finite volume in the manifold, right? 
Uh, let's see. Well, um, I guess I'm, I'm not baking in any particular expectation here. Okay. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So in the, in the context Wait, of the bootstrap, Eric, yes, yes. Do you, do you have examples of a theory with compact conformal manifolds? Uh, yes, and I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, okay, thanks. Yes. There are, there are explicit examples that are known, and then there are some consequences of what we're conjecturing that suggest that there are many. Okay, cool. Um, good. So the so conformal manifolds are tough for the bootstrap in the following sense. Um, the bootstrap seems to work best when you're dealing with the universality class of CFTs where um, there are isolated fixed points, okay, as opposed to a line of theories. And may, maybe this is, this is obvious, but um, you know, in case it's not, so let's sort of picture the situations that correspond to something like turn the bootstrap to 3D easing model, where you have some allowed region. And you know, originally maybe this region was a kink and it got shrunk to an island by studying multiple correlators. And we imagine that you know somewhere inside here um, is the 3D easing CFT. Okay, on the other hand, if you're dealing with a CFT with a control manifold where you have a line of fixed points say, the one-dimensional conformal manifold, then, and here I'm plotting, say, the dimensions of the two lowest lying operators against each other, as is typical in the bootstrap, then you, then you really, right, you, you will have at least a line here, and, you know, typically in the bootstrap approach, you will get some region which is bounded by that line, um, and so you need to, what you want to bootstrap the line corresponding to, you know, this line of fixed points that you might be searching for, but you know, of course, here I've just plotted two dimensions against each other, and there's an infinite set of CFT data, and so they're they're not all going to intersect at a line. You have much more space to cover, to chop out, and uh, you know, a more realistic picture of this is what happens, say, in n equals four super Yang nodes. Here's a nice plot um, from a paper of Beam, Bastelli, and our very own Bald Van Rees um, of the dimensions of the three lowest lying operators of, of spin zero, two, and four against each other. Okay, and so here they fix the central charge to be 15 quarters. And so the allowed region is this uh, uh, famed golden cube. Okay, and right as I say that the sun shines through the clouds, perfect. Um, so there was a conjecture that this point here is one of the, um, uh, Self dual points and at such a self dual point under SL2Z, uh, all the conformal data should be indeed extremized. But you know, in general, as you change the value of the angle of coupling, you're going to move somewhere inside this cube. And the typical bootstrap approach does not tell you how the dimensions actually trace out their path through this cube. <clears throat> now, there's been some work in the bootstrap combining integrated correlators. Uh, with numerics, so you have some integrated correlator which you've determined by some means analytically, integrated along M, and you try to feed this into a bootstrap of some other system of correlators. Uh, I'd say that has not been sort of fully maximized, but um, in any case, that approach feeds into some bootstrapping problem, something you've learned about the conformal manifold rather than trying to learn about the manifold itself from the bootstrapping. So there are two distinct goals um, that relate conformal manifolds to, to the bootstrap approach. You know, the first is the one I just explained was hard, which is to constrain the CFT data, the dimension spins and OP coefficients in the interior of some conformal manifold. Uh, the second though is to sort of do the converse, which is to constrain the properties of the conformal manifold, say the Zemlotikov metric, as a function of the CFT data. And that's the approach that we'll be taking today. And the idea for today is to focus on degeneration points of M, right, where you might just have a, an easier time um, of saying something. And so we want to know where are they, um, what do they look like, and how are they approached. All right, any questions about this? Uh, Eric, I have a question about conformal manifolds. Uh, 
Uh, do we know a priori that the, the, the conformal manifold is finite dimensional or it is some extra assumption? Uh, that doesn't, um, it doesn't seem to matter for, for what I'm going to, to say. Although an infinite dimensional conformal manifold in a, so, so yeah, I, I think that the right thing to say here is that if you're working in a, a non-perturbative CFT, so finite mm -hmm. end, all the parameters is finite, um, then you cannot have an infinite dimensional conformal manifold. The reason is that you would then have an infinite number of operators with dimension D and the partition function would diverge. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, so to get some inspiration for what to say about these generation points, let's sort of turn to the, the swampland approach to constraining theories of quantum gravity, which I'll just give a sort of very brief introduction to some, some part of this. Okay. So just the part that's, that's relevant for us. Although, um, you know, my opinion is that actually the bootstrap and swampland people should be learning more from each other and there's a lot more to, to say. So, it, you know, the, the approaches aren't all that different. What are, the, what are the swampland folks trying to do? Well, they're trying to constrain uh, theories of quantum gravity, uh, and they do this by <clears throat> imposing various conditions, sometimes the origins of which are kind of mysterious, to rule out um, or rule in, uh, in favorable cases, regions of parameter space in terms of parameters in low energy gravitational actions. Right, so here at C1 and C2 are some parameters and some bulk action. And by some principle or other, one hopes to rule out some, some range of this parameter space. Now, there's a lot of aspects of what is being done there. Um, what's pertinent today is something called the Swampland Distance Conjecture, which goes back to some paper of, of Alpha a while ago, but has, has been formalized and made more precise recently. And so that conjecture is the following statement, essentially. Near some infinite distance point in moduli space, uh, where here by moduli space, I mean some you know, modulus of a bulk gravitational theory, uh, two things happen. First, there's an infinite tower of states, which becomes massless. We have some pyro of the BPS operators or scalar fields down here. Um, mentioned going to zero. And second of all, the approach to masslessness is exponential in the distance measured in Planck units. And this parameter, which controls the exponential approach, uh, which is sometimes called alpha, is order one. And that's an important part of this conjecture. Now, the conjecture has not been, so, so alpha has not been rigorously bounded below or above. It's not believe necessarily that there's an upper bound, but it is believed in general there's a lower bound and there are conjectures for what this lower bound is, um, which you can think of as coming from imagining that UKK reduce on some manifold um, uh, in some simple way and that, and that gives you some lower bound, which I'm calling alpha KK, which is some simple one over square root to some function of the dimension D of the space time. Um, and uh, apologies that I know the complete references in this talk, but um, there are complete references in our paper, which I didn't give the archive number to, but I'm sure everyone here can figure it out if, if they want. Um, so the value of alpha, the fact that it's bounded and supposed to be order one is important. And, um, <clears throat> and it's also important that the distance is measured in Planck units as befits a constraint of a theory of quantum gravity. Another thing that's been observed and is I think believed by at least, by at least some um, is that at these points, there are always enhanced gauge symmetries. So you approach this infinite distance point and you have some gauge fields which emerge, some, some vectors which become massless and furnish some extra, extra symmetry in your problem. Um, these are sometimes associated to extended objects, uh, strings, brains uh, becoming light. And so the extent to which this is universal is from what I understand still an open problem, um, but it's suggestive uh, for us. Okay, so maybe staring at this set of criteria that are supposed to be part of the Twombly distance conjecture, one sees already something one can say about conformal manifolds by just analogizing and putting things together. Um, and so now it's time to, to move toward the, the uh, CFT distance conjecture. Let me first ask if there are any questions if, uh, before I go on.
Okay. And of course, you know, interruptions, welcome at any time. <clears throat> okay, so the first point is that, as discussed before, uh, at least in large classes of CFTs that have conformal manifolds, uh, say all 4D SCFTs, uh, the central charge is not a modulus. And in any case, if it sometimes is, we're not going to view it as such. So we're going to take the motivation from the swamp land distance conjecture to be looking at motion on conformal manifolds. One can make analogies between the swampland distance conjecture and families of CFTs parameterized by the central charge. And indeed, this was the um, perspective of a conjecture by Luce, Palti, and Waffe about ADS spaces with increasing radius, but that's not what we're going to do here. So we're going to take this logic and try to apply it to theories of uh, with exactly marginal operators. Now, often in physics, when we have some moduli space, the singularities occur only at the boundary of these moduli spaces. For example, two DCFT partition functions, uh, you know, should not diverge at finite temperature. Um, likewise, for perturbative scattering amplitudes, you take some OPE or collinear type limit, um, and you can get singularities and only in those types of limits. And sometimes there's symmetry enhancement at these singularities. Now, the problem for us is to try to understand what does it mean to be at a singular point in the space of conformal data? Because we're trying to characterize um, the boundary of the conformal manifold in terms of the other conformal data. So what does it mean to be at a singular point in the space of conformal data? Say the space of dimensions and OP coefficients of some theory. Now, in ADS, if you have a theory which is a, a field which is becoming massless and has spin greater than zero, that is dual to an operator in the CFT, which is saturating uh, the respective unitarity bound for spin J operators. So if you have a dimension delta J operator of spin J, and here I'm just imagining that the operator is a symmetric traceless tensor and thinking of J as the spin, but you can think of J as a multi-index for more general cases and everything I'm saying here applies. And the dimension is bounded below by D minus two plus J. And it's saturated in the case when the operator is the conserved current. So if you imagine a set of operators or fields in ADS becoming massless, uh, they would correspond to, if they had spin, uh, operators becoming conserved in your dual CFT. Now, in the CFT in greater than two dimensions, as I mentioned before, not perturbatively, an infinite tower of currents must contain all spins. Right? And so, so again, what, what's the proof? The proof is just that the partition function is finite. So if we're thinking about situations where you have infinite towers of currents becoming conserved, then this corresponds to uh, having an infinite higher spin tower of currents. So let's make a flash of this kind of picture where you have spin J and, and uh, well, I want to hear what's going on in that call, it's too bad. Um, so, uh, so we have the stress tensor, which has spin two in dimension D. And if you have a spin four current, then an operator here, a spin six current, an operator here, and so on. And so this set of operators would form the leading reg -H trajectory of operators. And in the case that they're all conserved as I've drawn it, it's a linear, exactly linear trajectory. We're gonna call CFTs with at least one trajectory, which is exactly linear like this, higher spin points. And we're calling them higher spin points because they have an infinite tower of higher spin conserved currents. So the first fact is that free CFTs are higher spin points. You might be familiar with this. Um, and we have asked a question about this at the beginning. Um, this can be seen representation theoretically. Uh, this is sometimes known as the flato fransdahl theorem. Uh, it was also understood by Eastwood at the level of the Laplacian acting on a scalar field. But if you take a tensor product of two singleton representations, then you get this infinite tower of higher spin bilinears in phi. And you can think of each of these as, as a current. Okay, so here's T. J4, and so on. So it's known that every free CFT um, has an infinite tower of higher spin currents. 
uh, sorry, Eric. Is it uh, clear that uh, the partition function of a CFT is always finite? I would say that if the CFT is not perturbatively well defined, yes. Um, and by finite here, maybe I can be a little more precise. I mean that for any fixed dimension delta, there's a finite number of operators below that dimension. Right, but is there a proof of this or it's an expectation? Um, let's see. Or maybe it's a question we can defer to the end? I'd say it's almost a definition. Um, if so, so we go, if, if we if we demand that the degeneracies of the partition function are finite, then what I'm saying follows rather trivially. Whether a non-perturbatively defined CFT has to have a finite finite degeneracies um, is a different matter. But the only right that's like asking in, in, so in two D there are non-compact CFTs which you can formally think of as having infinite degeneracies if you view it as a but a limit of a compact CFT. But in greater than two dimensions, I don't know a phenomenon like that which occurs and say preserves unitarity, but that, that seems like it's a... So here, of course, by partition function, you mean a partition function at finite volume, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stay on this. Um, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. It, yeah, where I get to use the state operator correspondence. Okay, good. So free CFTs are higher spin points. I think this is well known. Uh, by now, what's also well known is that higher spin points are necessarily free in the following sense. So this was shown by Maldesen and Trubuedov and, and various follow-up works. Um, if you have a unitary CFT, and so in addition, the CFT has is local, so it has a unique stress tensor with finite central charge. That's what this asterisk is supposed to denote. And if that CFT contains a single higher spin current, then the CFT breaks up into a free piece and perhaps a non-trivial interacting piece, which is to say that there exists necessarily an infinite tower of higher spin currents, first of all. And second of all, the correlators of those currents are those of a free theory. And so now we're ready to, to phrase our, our main conjecture because we've assembled lots of pieces of data and, and they're all sort of hovering around this relation between higher spin points on the one hand and infinite distance on the other. And so what you might call Conjecture one is that all higher spin points are at infinite distance. Now, this is something that I'm putting in quotes because you can prove this for superconformal theories in, in 4D at least, as we did in our paper. Um, so calling it a conjecture is you know, slightly weaker than one needs to, to phrase it. But the main conjecture really is that all infinite distance points are higher spin points. This is something we call conjecture two in our paper, and that's the main conjecture to this point. Now, it's nice to phrase this in terms of the diameter of M. So first, oops, um, let's just introduce some definitions. So we're going to define the anomalous dimension of some, some spin J current. That's the dimension of that operator minus the dimension at the unitarity bound. And we can grade our Hilbert space by spin. And let's give this a label T for the Hilbert space at some point T on the conformal manifold where T specifies the center exactly marginal couplings. So if we define the following quantity, delta a gamma j of t, which is going to be the minimum. Okay. Minimum dimension uh, of some operator O in the spin j part of the Hilbert space. So, in other words, 
this delta J of T uh, represents the leading register trajectory at some point from a manifold. Then we can rephrase our conjecture in a slightly different way as a statement about the diameter. If the infimum of the spin four anomalous dimension, everywhere in the control manifold uh, is strictly positive, then the diameter is finite. But here I'm using the, the so, so first of all, spin four, because not every higher spin algebra has a spin three current, but they always have a spin four current. Uh, the one example to keep in mind is just that of a real scalar. So because it's real, there's no spin three current, but there is a spin four current. So we're using the spin four current as, as this proxy. And I'm using the, the terminology infimum because I'm trying to be careful about the statement that when you go to infinite distance, you're taking a sequence of points and the infinite distance point is not strictly on M. And we're, we're trying to be careful about the language about this in the paper. But you know, morally speaking, what this is saying is that if the anomalous dimension for the spin four operator never actually reaches zero, then the diameter is finite. And that's a, a rephrasing essentially of conjecture two here. More in terms of this global quantity, the diameter. Sorry, a question here. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you picking a specific spin four operator or you define this in the whole set of possible spin four operators? The latter. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? So this is, this is sort of part one of, so we call CFT distance conjecture. There are a few different parts. This is say the first, first and second parts. Um, uh, next we'll talk about how these infinite distance points are approached. Uh, let me just pause and ask if there are any other questions first. Okay, so indeed, yes, we want to know how are these points approached. And, and I want to remind everyone, you know, it's useful to keep in mind the swamp plane distance conjecture in the back of your head uh, for this discussion. Okay, so uh, let's take an example of A gauge coupling, and we'll write it in this complexified way. Now, at order g squared, I guess by now this sort of O symbol stood for three things theta, an operator, and order, but uh, you know, we're all physicists, we can, we can figure out what these mean in the right context. So, at first order in perturbation theory around weakly coupled fixed point, Some operators will acquire anomalous dimensions. So the CFT is not free anymore. And that actually implies that all higher spin currents are broken. Right? And what's the argument? Well, it's just multi signature boy off. If you had one that was unbroken, then there'd be an infinite set of them that are unbroken, and the theory would have a free subsector, but it's it's not free anymore. So that doesn't happen. And so we have anomalous dimensions, gamma j, which are going to be some function of j times g squared uh, plus dot dot dot. Okay. Now this is simple enough, um, but what we want to do, what's going on here? What's our goal? We want to write this in terms of the distance. With respect to the Zamolotikov metric. Now, <clears throat> suppose that this uh, relation between g squared and the distance is exponential. Then that's the statement that the Zamolotikov metric. Is locally hyperbolic near this infinite distance point, which I'll call p infinity. Okay. So we have the following behavior: d tau d tau bar uh, beta squared is some constant over in tau squared plus dot dot dot. Okay. So integrating this, you see that the relationship between m tau and the distance would be uh, exponential. <coughs> Yes. Uh, I don't know whether it's for everybody, but um, for 
for for a couple of minutes your 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 slide is a little bit too low to see the lower part oh ah, really for me it's like that oh ah. um maybe you're zoomed in a little bit um in the view options but um well it's always uh, in the lowest part so maybe yeah if you can move it a bit more i mean yeah, i can yeah, see it properly the, but it's not like very very comfortable I, i'm seeing i'm seeing the <clears throat> Well, I'm seeing what I'm really seeing on the tablet, but I think if you, um, I okay. can try to move it up. But yeah, under view options, if you get a zoom ratio, that, sometimes that happens if it's zoomed in too much. That's all I can offer, but. Uh, I think it's the lower way. bar of the zoom as well, which can cover part of it. So for example, right now I see everything, uh, I see the claim and then define, and then there's a line with define, but I don't <laughs> see anything yeah. below define. Good, yeah, I wasn't trying to. What I, what I wanted to do was to have it be here. Um, okay, so that's that's that's, that's the squared. Okay. Yep. Okay. okay. So that's here, but I don't know, Jan, if you are seeing that or not. Okay. Um, all right. So good. Now, now this dot 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 is interesting, <clears throat> but not relevant for us. It's been computed in in uh, very nicely in, using localization and some four D n equals two theories. Uh, and the beta squared is some constant, and for gauge fields, you can compute this. Um, and this just comes from, from weak contractions, because after all, we're just computing a two-point function of trace f squared at a free fixed point. And for gauge fields, this equals 24 mg, which we use gauge group. Okay. But in any case, the claim that we're making is that the Zemlog carbon metric is always locally hyperbolic near infinite distance points. If we define a sub-manifold of m <coughs> to be um, that submanifold where the spin four dimension is greater than some epsilon, so we think of epsilon as controlling the higher spin gap, then that leads us to conjecture three, which I hope uh, is visible to all, which is <clears throat> if the infimum of uh, gamma four is zero, which is to say if the higher spin gap goes to zero in some limiting procedure along M starting from the interior, then the diameter uh, not only diverges, it diverges logarithmically in the higher spin gap. And that's the same statement as this exponential behavior. Uh, sorry, Eric, are you saying that the um, curvature of this manifold is constant? Uh, so this is just the local behavior near that point. So, um, so what does it mean locally hyperbolic? I mean, as you, as you approach large M tau, the metric looks like this. Um, but that would imply then uh, constant curvature, right? In the limit, yeah. But not. But you say that the metric is always locally hyperbolic, but only around p infinity, not around any point on the manifold. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And and uh, indeed, so in these calculations, um, this infinite series of subleading corrections is computed and. Okay, that's still around p infinity, but you know it is an infinite series, and they've looked at the asymptotics and the um, yeah, the general behavior is. I'd love to be able to say more, but it's complicated, probably. <clears throat> okay, those are the conjectures. Let's make some comments. Um, first, so we are demanding that the CFT here is local, um, which is to say, it includes a, a stress tensor, and we're we're doing that just to avoid. Um, some types of examples that Miguel alluded to earlier, um, but but not so much as a matter of avoidance, really just as a matter of principle. We're using this because the Malda Sanish Avoidov theorem, uh, for example, uses this fact. And we want to have a conformal manifold defined um, in such that it obeys the usual tenets of conformal perturbation theory. The second comment is that. Besides these general arguments, there's evidence from SCFTs and free gauge fields, some of which we'll talk about next. The third comment is that we're not making a claim about subleading radio trajectories. This is really just a statement that there's at least one tower of higher spin currents at these infinite distance points. And vector models versus matrix models have different degeneracies of these types of operators. And in the vector case, imagining say the OM model in three dimensions, there's just a single tower of higher spin currents and, and that's fine. And finally, the case of two dimensions is, is different. It's different for several reasons. So first of all, because of your Soro symmetry, all the composites of the stress tensor 
are exactly conserved and they furnish an infinite higher spin tower of currents, uh, each of which is a global, that is to say, quasi primary. Um, if you try to upgrade everything to say, okay, well, let's just imagine, let's just replace global primary with Virasoro primary, well, still there are algebras like Wn, which have an infinite number of Virasoro primary higher spin currents. Then you might say, okay, well, let's use as a notion of higher spin the strong generators of some 2D chiral algebra. Say so in the Wn case, you would have uh, n minus one such currents. But even then, there is no claim that um, higher spin CFTs must be free, just to say Malda Senna Jovoyedov does not hold. And indeed, there are familiar classes of CFTs with higher spin symmetry that are interacting, say the WN mineral models. Now, in two dimensions, there are some previous work I alluded to earlier by Kansevich and Sobelman, who claim that at infinite distance, uh, the scalar gap closes. Um, I don't have anything to say about that other than to just observe that our conjecture and their conjecture together can be unified as the statement that um, the twist gap closes to d minus two in d dimensions at higher spin points. Okay, so in two dimensions, their claim is that the non-trivial part is that the scalar gap closes, so the scalar, some scalars are becoming uh, acquired in dimension zero. And for us, the statement is that this infinite tower of higher spin currents are acquiring zero anomalous dimension two, and so they acquire a twist d minus two where a twist is dimension minus spin. Okay, so right. let's talk, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you also conjecture that the metric is asymptotically, always asymptotically hyperbolic or locally hyperbolic? Yes, that is um, equivalent to, to, this, to this here. Uh, you, you seem to say that, but I don't see it because uh, aren't you, I don't see how this would imply the, the hyperbolicity of the metric. I mean, aren't you assuming that gamma goes like g squared and not, like if gamma would vanish exponentially with g, mm -hmm. so it's e to the minus one over g, mm -hmm. right? Would you then not, I don't see how that conjecture would, would lead to hyperbolicity of the, of the metric. Yeah. So, so because you have a function on the manifold and you have a metric on the manifold. And mm -hmm. if you don't tell me what the function looks like, then I don't know what, how it would imply anything about the metric. Absolutely. I'm saying the function always looks like this because if you had, Why? so, so, it, so at perturbatively in G, at order G squared, if there is at least some operator which acquires an anomalous dimension, then we should think of the CFT as not free anymore, right? I see. So then you do conformal perturbation theory. Right. So, so if it's not free, then all of the higher spin currents must be broken. Now, there might be some loophole in that argument. Um, so, okay. you can imagine I can that see there's some going. kind of subsector where, you know, some uh, crossing invariant subsector, which somehow does not acquire anomalous dimensions and remains. Free, but oh, I'd say like non perturbative anomalous dimensions, right? So, not the perturbative, yeah, yeah, anomalous right? Dimension. I mean, that, that's the case you mentioned before. I just I don't think that that um, can can happen, and and this is the argument, sure. Why, um, okay, this, yeah, I don't I don't quite see it either, but anyway, it's a bit tangential, so maybe you should just continue. Thanks, sure, yeah. Okay, so okay, let's let's talk a little bit about um, the superconformal case. And indeed, you know, some of the motivation for this really did come from thinking about what we know um, about four dn equals two and uh, a little bit four dn equals four. So um, in four dn equals four, the the situation is somewhat um, trivial in that O uh, lives in the stress tensor multiplet uh, by virtue of n equals four from a representation theory. And so if the theory has a unique stress tensor, uh, then the dimension of the control manifold is one. And maximal supersymmetry buys you that 
actually the metric is exactly the Poincaré metric uh, over the entire upper half plane. So this is an exact statement, exact to n equals four. Um, now in 40 n equals two, things can get you know much much very true. Um, and you know this is there's a lot to to say, and I'm I'm far from an expert on all that can be said. It is believed that all exactly marginal couplings in 40 n equals two SCFTs um, can be obtained by by gauging um, subgroups of a global symmetry of some collection of of SCFTs, and that's something I learned from another one of Bob's papers. Um, this is formalized as a statement of decomposability, um, which is that all n equals two SCFTs with control manifolds can be obtained in this way. And so you have some n-dimensional control manifold. And let's draw it like this, okay? There might be various cusps, and each cusp corresponds to a location where one of the uh, exactly marginal parameters uh, gets to be interpreted as gauge coupling, which is going to zero. Okay. So, um, taking one of these cusps just for simplicity. The Zamological metric near that cusp uh, can be computed just by thinking of the fact that the CFT is decomposing into a free gauge field times the rest, which is still interacting, presumably. Okay, and so for a free gauge field, again, you can just compute this by Wick contractions and you get this result. Um, and again, you know, this stuff's not relevant for us here. What we really care about is this leading term here. And so this has been, you know, I mean, this, this follows generally speaking from the statement that you are reaching the infinite distance point by taking a gauge coupling to zero, right? And the, and the point is that all 40 n equals two SCFTs are believed to have this property. Now, if there exists n equals two SCFT in which this exactly marginal coupling is not a complexified gauge coupling, in other words, if decomposability is actually violated, then that is not, you know, in contradiction with anything we're saying. In fact, we're making a prediction that the conformal manifold is compact along that direction, right? And the reason that that follows is because just by looking at the representation theory of the multiplets you have available, um, uh, a gauge field is, is the only way you can go to infinite distance um, is, is the idea. I should say that in the n equals two context, a proof of local hyperbolicity near these infinite distance points seems possible. Um, it's been argued in early work by uh, Gomez and, and others that the conformal manifold is, is Kähler Hodge. And this is some statement about the, the cycles of the conformal manifold. And in the context of Kähler Hodge Calabia manifolds, a very similar statements of uh, local hyperbolicity near infinite distance points have been proven. Um, for reasons I don't completely understand, those proofs don't straightforwardly apply uh, to what we're talking about here. And the sense in which these conformal manifolds are Kähler Hodge is slightly different or needs to at least be understood in a more refined way before straightforwardly applying that. But I think this is a setting in which it's possible to prove this uh, property of the Zamological metric near infinite distance. And do I have about, uh, Eight minutes or something like this so well we started slightly later than 11 so what time is it uh, let's say well 15 slightly more than 15 minutes maybe great okay thanks that should be that should be sufficient so now let's go down to 40 n equals one so in this case um there are known theories with exactly marginal couplings which are not just gauge couplings, but there are super potential couplings. And uh, the claim that we're making is that these are compact directions of n. 
Okay, you can't go to infinite distance by tuning one of these to zero. Um, and I'm choosing not to go into such, such detail. We talk a bit about examples in the paper, but morally speaking, um, one can think of this as a difference in the way conformal perturbation theory works in the presence or absence of gauge fields. Now, 3dn equals two is similar to 4dn equals one, um, except that there are no conformal Maxwell fields. There are, of course, Trinsimons fields, but the Trinsimons coupling is quantized, and so those don't uh, uh, generate a directional and a conformal manifold for you. Likewise, there are families of Trinsimons matter field, uh, theories in 3D, which are conformal and seem to have a tough coupling, but that's a large N artifact. And so the bona fide finite N theory does not have a conformal manifold. So the claim is that in 3D, at least combining what we're saying with some other uh, lore about the ways in which you generate conformal manifolds um, without gauge fields, uh, what we're suggesting is that in 3D, all conformal manifolds are actually compact. There's a nice paper by, um, by Baggio and Luria and others um, called Decoding a Three-Dimensional Conformal Manifold in which they study the conformal manifold of a certain class of theories and they find indeed that it's compact. And actually they were concerned with studying more refined properties of it, but you can, you can read the paper and you can see that it's compact. Okay, so the claim here is that actually in three dimensions, they all are. Okay, so now on to the holography segment and we're gonna make more quantitative contact with um, this sort of CFT version of the Swampland distance conjecture. Um, any questions before, before doing that? Uh, Eric, is it known uh, what the asymptotic curvature of the manifold is in, for a generic CFT? When you say curvature, you mean which? I mean, it, you, you said it's a hypergolic manifold. It has constant curvature. What is this curvature? Well, I would say it's, I mean, it's not even known that it's always hyperbolic. I mean, that's part of what we're saying. So, so it, is, it is not known generally. Yeah, the answer to your question is not known generally. I see. I think in any close to in 40, the curvature is not necessarily constant. It's, it's negative, but I don't think it's... Uh... It's constant. It's constant in n equals four, but in n equals two, it's something you can compute. It's a function on the conformal manifold if you take the Ricci scalar, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's not known. I think. Well, actually, maybe this is an opportunity to ask. It's known in those cases that uh, here, I guess you have in mind these n equals two super QCD computations. Um, yeah. So, so they did they prove that everywhere on M the curvature is negative? Is is that obvious? No, that's not obvious. Actually, we have a bootstrap result uh, where- Please announce uh, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we, we have a bootstrap result, which if you extrapolate to infinite derivatives, it seems to indicate that the uh, uh, curvature can be, that there can be some kind of bound on the, on the curvature, which seems to indicate that it's negative. But uh, in one dimension, uh, I think, our result would immediately, our extrapolated result would immediately imply that the curvature is negative. If you have a higher dimensional conformal manifold, you need to play a bit because show that some components of the Riemann tensor are negative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ah, very nice. Yeah, I'd like to know more about that. Um, and I think understanding things like that would be one possible path to, to proving the claim that I'm making about infinite distance points. And this also gives me an opportunity to mention a couple of papers, which I sort of obliquely alluded to without, without names earlier. Um, so there, there's a paper by Connor Behan and a paper by Bertolini et al from around the same time, which actually aim to use the vanishing beta function equations um, applied to the second order conformal perturbation theory um, to constrain CFTs with conformal manifolds. So there are some sum rules and they're, they're rather intricate, um, they're, they're rigorous, but, but complicated. And so um, those deserve to be, to be mentioned as papers um, making some progress on this question from the bootstrap angle.
And hopefully Bob's uh, result will also soon become a paper that we can all read. Um, good, okay. So in the remaining time, let's talk a little Sorry, bit. Sorry, Eric. Graphics. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Hey, um, so in the Club of Winton SCFT, uh, there's an exactly marginal double trace operator. Um, are you saying that that direction is compact? Um, it's yes. known to be compact. Yes. It's, it's known to be compact in that case? So in that case, there, there, there's a 2D control manifold and one direction is, um, so, yeah, so, so the one direction is believed to be non-compact and one is believed to be compact. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, everything I know about that I learned from Strassler's Tassi notes um, and talking to Leonardo. Um, but yeah, th those notes seem to have stood the test of time. We'll return actually to Klebanov wooden type theories at the, the very end here. Good. So, so what is the ADS dual of the CFT near this infinite distance point? Well, I think there's no need to belabor it. Uh, just kind of translating the ingredients, you see that there would be a tower of higher spin gauge fields, so massless higher spin fields of increasing spin all the way to infinity. And of course, a massless scalar field, uh, which corresponds to the exactly marginal operator in the dual CFT. If near this infinite distance point, we write the bulk action as, you know, Einstein Hilbert plus scalar kinetic term plus whatever. And of course this whatever can include various powers of curvature. I'm just writing the Einstein Hilbert term to set the conventions for the Planck scale. Um, then this parameter eta, well, first of all, it's bounded above by order one. You know, if it, if it were parametrically much larger, then since I've normalized by the Planck scale, right, the Planck scale is the shortest distance in the theory of quantum gravity. So this parameter here is, is bounded above. Um, of course, it can also be, be small. Um, and so the claim we're making sort of corresponds in the bulk to the statement that the masses of these higher spin fields uh, go to zero exponentially, where here I'm writing d hat as the distance in Planck units now, and alpha in terms of this parameter eta is one over two root eta. Okay. Now, translating to CFT variables uh, using your holographic dictionary here, you look stuff up in your dictionary, be that Magoo or wherever, uh, you can write eta in terms of the quantity we defined earlier. Uh, beta is the coefficient of the zenological metric near the infinite distance point, and CT, the central charge, which is the norm of the stress tensor, okay, times some D-dependent factor. So, right, obviously, it isn't just intuitively clear. When you write the distance in Planck units, you're going to renormalize the parameter by some power of the central charge. Okay, so suppose that tau is a gauge coupling, right? This is the case that I feel like we understand a bit the most. Uh, and we computed beta squared. So in this case, alpha is root 2c over dim g. And in superconformal theories, say n equals one or n equals two, we can write this in terms of the central charge of the appropriate vector multiplet. Now, excuse me, this is two here. But of course, CFTs just with these vector multiplets are not conformal, right? They're not CFTs. So what is the optimal bound? From here, you learn that, um, or from this bound, you learn that alpha is bounded below uh, by one over root three in the n equals two case and one over uh, two in the n equals one case, right? And those are strict lower bounds, but we wanna know what is the optimal bound, right? What is, what is the actual CFT, which has central charge as small as possible for a given C vector? Right. And so what we observe actually is that in a wide range of CFTs, alpha is bounded below by one over root two, okay? Now, 
this is saturated by n equal source of real nodes, right? So here's, let's put this in the box so we all remember it. So in n equals four super angles, the central charge C is just dmg over four, okay? Uh, what's the next piece of evidence? Well, Lagrangian SCFTs have been fully classified. There's an asterisk here to indicate that there's some assumption made about the gauge group. So, um, you know, simple or semi-simple, depending on whether you're n equals one or n equals two, but there have been very robust classification schemes. And in particular for n equals one theories, there's a paper by Zafrir and, and Razamat, which classifies all Lagrangian n equals one theories with simple gauge group and a weak coupling point on a conformal manifold. And you can check that alpha obeys this inequality in those cases. So actually, let me import a table from our paper. So on the left, you have the gauge group. And so the second column is just referring to a table in that paper I just alluded to, where these theories are, are written down. Uh, the third column is the central charge. And here we're interested in large n limits, of course, because we're trying to make comparison to, to gravity now. I should have said that more clearly before. And in the large n limit, C over dim G, you plug it into the definition of alpha and you get these values. Okay. So this is the column we care about. They all obey the bound I mentioned. Now you might notice that there are two of these which seem to saturate it. And these are theories where A actually equals C at large n, a uh, point which I'll come back to in just a second. Uh, the third piece of evidence for this being a robust bound, or at least the set of CFTs that, that seems to obey it, uh, are duals to ADS5 times Sasaki Einstein 5 vacuum of type 2b. These theories have central charge, uh, which is the central charge of n equals 4 times the relative volumes of S5 and the SE5 manifold. Okay. And there's a known result due to Bishop that this ratio is greater than one, the saturation only when the Sasaki Einstein manifold is the round sphere. So if such a CFT, if such a CFT has a weakly coupled point with some G valued gauge fields, then alpha is greater than one over root two, right? Because the central charge is greater than that of n equals four and n equals four gives you the lower bound here. Now we referred before to the Clement of Witten theory. That is an example where SE5 equals T11. Um, and so this is a statement about all such quiver gauge theories. And um, uh, if they have weakly coupled points, then they seem to all obey this, this stronger bound. It would be interesting to try to prove this. OK, maybe here we, well. Last comment. Uh, yeah, yeah. Up. Indeed, that's, uh, that's exactly what I was doing. So uh, good. So as, as a final aside, before mentioning some open questions, all the Lagrangian SCFTs with weakly coupled uh, points on the conformal manifold and large n limits have C greater than or equal to A. This is just an empirical observation by looking at the classifications I mentioned before. Now, combining this with the fact that they're Lagrangian theories, you can rewrite the CNA anomaly coefficients in terms of dim G and the representation content, the matter content of the theory. And that just immediately implies that alpha is bounded below by one over root two. So one way to, to phrase this, this sort of second point here is just that as it happens, all Lagrangian SCFTs with weakly coupled uh, points in their conformal manifolds emitting large n limits obey this property. Um, I don't totally understand why this is true. It's not unfamiliar to those who've worked in SCFT. Uh, C greater than A theories are traditionally easier to generate, but, but why is it true? And second of all, does it suggest some special role for theories with A equals C, which saturate this possible bound? Uh, it's a necessary condition for a large central charge theory to have an Einstein gravity dual at strong coupling that A equals C. It's not necessarily sufficient, but it's necessary. But here we're very far from the Einstein regime, right? We're in the opposite regime where you have a higher spin theory in the bulk. So the significance of this type of theory in the context of the CFT distance conjecture uh, is unclear, but maybe this is kind of a tantalizing uh, remark. Okay, so Here's my conclusion slide and um, there are various open questions. Um, in view of time, I won't, I won't go on and on. I'll just use, use words, which, you know, the obvious question, of course, when making conjecture is, can you prove it? 
I think maybe easier at hand would be to try to prove this statement about local hyperbolicity near infinite distance points. Uh, more generally, we would love to relate the structure of correlators to the geometry on M more explicitly. And it sounds like Bolt and others are already doing this in a nice way, uh, but surely there's more to understand. And with respect to the connections to the swampland, um, this bound I mentioned is a kind of ADS avatar of what uh, people are trying to do in that context. I'm sure there are connections between those two approaches, which should be understood better. But for now, let me just stop here. Thanks. OK, thank you very much for the, for the nice talk. We had uh, lots of questions. Uh, are there any more questions over there? I have a question. Yes. All right. Uh, I'm not, I don't understand uh, your, uh, let's go above your argument uh, that uh, uh, the partition function of uh, CF CFT is finite, uh, then you have a, a tower of high spin current. Um, would you like me to Yeah, go up, uh, go up to, or, um, go up to that, uh, that part. Um, you want me to return the slides to that part? Is that what you're? Sure, I can do that. Uh... Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, first, uh, how the partition function is defined here? I'm not uh, very sure about it because we don't have a Lagrangian here. It's true, but if we write it in the Hilbert space formulation, just as trace e to the minus beta h, where I'm on S1 cross S d minus one, then the <clears throat> powers of e to the minus beta just multiply the degeneracies of local operators with those dimensions. And that's all that I'm using. Okay, so how does this lead to the, to the infinite tower of the, this is a conserved current, right? Yes, it's a conserved current. And the, and the point is that imagine you had an infinite number of conserved currents of the same spin. Well, a conserved current of fixed spin has fixed dimension. Yes. So if you have an infinite number of them, the degeneracy at some dimension of the uh, unflavored partition function would be infinite. Uh, so why don't, okay. Okay, I got you, I got what you mean, thank you. Sure, yeah. Um, so, and you know, maybe this is an opportune time to mention, conformal manifolds have points where you have enhanced global symmetries. Uh, this has been exhibited by way of conformal dualities in SCFTs. Um, and a lot of that stuff is, is beyond my, my pay grade, but situations where you have enhanced global symmetry, that's not enough to, you know, that doesn't suggest that there's something interesting happening from the perspective of the geometry of M there, because the global symmetries are, are always gonna be finite rank and um, and so that's very different from the kind of situation that we're, that we're talking about, about here. So that, that was part of the motivation why, you know, we're, we're, one wants to seek these infinite distance points and relate them to higher spin points, right? So earlier I posed the question, what, what is the singular point on M in terms of the CFT data? Um, and the answer that we're, we're giving is that you have an infinite set of operators which are approaching the unitarity bound. Um, and this does not correspond just to some finite dimensional global symmetry enhancement. So there was a, well, David and Giot wanted to ask a question. Oh, there you are. Yes, hi. Hi, Eric. Uh, hi. And, and uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, uh, so uh, as you know, we, uh, we proposed um, this, this bound on alpha. Uh, from the swampland, which for the CFT4 ADS5 would be uh, one of the square root of 12. So I was wondering whether you had any any idea why there's such a gap to your one over square root of two. Um, yes, so, <laughs> I, so, so it wasn't, um, my understanding was that the quantities we're talking about are slightly different and maybe I've misread your paper, but. This could very well be, but uh, I, I just wanna have your opinion on this. I, so for one thing, the, so when you say apply it to the ADS case, um, 
I mean, the bound that you're talking about, I thought was formulated where you have a Minkowski background in the non-compact directions. And so, so you know, literally speaking, these are, these are different settings. And I don't, I feel like I don't understand well the contact between the type of bound you're talking about, which applies to Minkowski compactifications and the bound we're talking about, which applies to ADS. There's definitely no a priori reason why they should coincide. And, you know, for example, given some, you know, 10 dimensional flat space theory, there are many ADS compactifications and, and, the, and the theories and the bulk and the associated TFTs are all different from each other. So on the other hand, I think there should be some mileage that one can get from the fact that you can take flat space limits of ADS theories. And, but I haven't totally understood that. Now in that context, there are also these questions about whether you can achieve scale separation. And so, uh, you know, it might matter whether you're talking about a situation where you do or do not in terms of the number you get for some exponent. Um, but that, you know, given some ADS background, you, you just ask, does it have large or small extra dimensions? And when you take the flat space limit, the process proceeds accordingly and you should get some I, I'd like to be able to relate the exponent I'm talking about to the one you're talking about more concretely. Yeah, no, absolutely. That would be uh, okay. But I, I, I certainly agree with the point of ADS versus Minkowski for now. Yeah. Uh, but maybe related to this, um, I mean, how about considering different towers? Um, is that any possibility or? So, Yes, so, so actually again about this point that we are referring to these infinite higher spin towers, this is of a different nature than what I guess is traditionally discussed in the Swampland uh, setting where you have an right. infinite set of massless scalars. Um, right, yeah. And so from the CFT distance conjecture to the Swampland in that direction, I think one thing we're suggesting is that maybe there are also always higher spin degrees of freedom becoming light too. But in, from the swamp plane to the CFT distance conjecture direction, I don't really know what to make of the fact that you have these infinite set of scalars becoming light in that context, because uh, for the same reason that, that we're sort of discussing here about these infinities, but also for the more fundamental reason that scalar saturating unitarity bounds aren't particularly special. There's no symmetry enhancement um, they are not connected to infinite sets of other operators by way of the analyticity of CFT data in the same way. And so I don't feel, it, so, so you might be right that the two constructions are just referring to different towers and, and maybe that's that actually. But I even just struggle to understand why the tower of massive scalars in the swamp land setting, what they would have to tell us about infinite distance points in the ADS setting because there, there just should not be, in a sensible, finite end theory, a pile up of scalars at some dimension. Um, maybe I'm thinking too narrow-mindedly, and at infinite distance, this is possible, but um, infinite distance limits can also give you theories which are not formally CFTs um, in, the, in the sort of axiomatic sense. And, um, so maybe you actually just get something else. And then what I'm saying here is does not apply to those situations. Uh, so as you can see, I'm a little confused about how these things relate to each other, but you make a good point that maybe the, the towers that are being discussed are, are different. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with what you see. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, anyone else questions over there? Well, I actually have one. So this, there was this uh, paper by uh, Baum and uh, Calderon Infante. Yes. Mm -hmm. How, I mean, well, I'm just an outsider, so I, well, I mean, yeah. Um, I'm wondering how their paper is fitting. Like, I know the questions that they're addressing, they're somehow similar, but uh, how, well, how does it fit? Uh, I would say they're, 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 very, they're very compatible in that, um, so they're mostly focusing on the 40 n equals two story, you, you know, which is on more on firmer ground, um, and they are making the same claim that that we are, um, and they give a nice discussion of what happens in the bulk in terms of tensionless string theory and higher spin degrees of freedom, 
um, becoming massless. Uh, so, so the first approximation, I would say these papers are completely, completely agree. The conjectures we're making are, are more general and you know, depending on your perspective, you might say less substantiated, um, but they're, they're perfectly compatible as far as I'm concerned. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, I think uh, well, we can thank you again for the very nice talk. Um, thank you. So, thank you.